the other woman, my name is Dr. Messia, I'm from the SG, so I'm a position group at the University of Bern. And what I'm going to talk today is about Biforest, which is a framework that we have developed by the SG. Uh, and well, what the, the message I would like to bring you today is uh, how do we let small computers, right? And why is that important? So, I guess that most of you are quite familiar with this phrase. It's from Alan Kay, uh, a keynote in Uppsala, 1997. So, he said, Computer revolution has not happened yet. So, what he basically meant by this was that we improve the things that we have, the way we're thinking. Just we, we make a small improvement instead of having a new way of thinking. So this is different in that. So we just use computers as a way of improving what we have, instead of using computers as having a new way of thinking. So if we apply that idea uh, uh, to object orientation, right, and the, the state that we are in right now with a small term as an example of object orientation, uh, and particularly we take the dynamic feature, so we are really proud we have this beautiful language which is small term and we are really proud it's dynamic and we laugh of, of the other languages but not that dynamic and the problem is that we still are not that dynamic because in our minds we're going to do the switch completely we are still going back to the source code to do stuff and I'm going to show you examples of how we do it constantly so this is how computer revolution has not happened for us, right? It's a big deal. It's like we think we are dynamic, but sometimes we have to escape from it. We have to find out why. Uh, so let's take an example, debugging, right? So we have source code, right? And we can somehow we run the source code, and then we get a beautiful debugger. Everybody knows this, right? It's kind of a standard. Good. And so we are here in Dubai, we are analyzing things, but we didn't go with that. And at a certain point, we realize that there is an instance variable uh, that is changing, right? And we do not know what, we have no idea. So what do we do? So we want to know why, who, and how is changing. What do we do? We... Breakpoint. Sorry? Breakpoint. That's right. So we go back to the source code, place breakpoints there, or here, right? There. In I don't know how many places. So if you take an example, the PC counter in compile method, it's in 250 different places. And it's 65 times being accessed or changed. So it's kind of a, in some cases it's kind of a taunting idea. So you have to go there and start looking and you escape from the runtime where the objects are. And you went back to uh, this this is static uh, representation. What? So if we have all the good stuff there, why do we have to do that? So that's that's the problem that we face every day. We are we have a highly dynamic system and a really cool language, but we are still thinking uh, in a static way in some cases, right? So we have all this cool stuff here, but we do not use it to its utmost extent. Okay? So we need to do that to bring everything up front. That's the idea. So let, let me show you another quick example, profiling. Uh, so basically we do the same, right? We have source code, we run it, we somehow instrument generally the source code, we run it, and then we get some kind of report. This is a, an extract from message type. You most of you know it. And the problem with this is that the information that we get here is, has no relationship with the domain, so with the live objects that we are analyzing. Let me give you an example. Uh, most of you know Modern, this is from Moose. Uh, it's a graph, a drawing tool. So we can build things like that, right? So this is system complexity, it's the polymetric. Uh, it was done by Lanza and in 2003. And we ran, we had a problem in Modern, uh, basically uh, was running solely uh, when it was the, the, the nodes were being displayed. and. We, we try to uh, profile that, and what we get is kind of this, right? Message study. So the, the big question is, so if we see, can see that there is a lot of consumption in this player. So the question is, what's the relationship there? What's the relationship between this dead uh, 
is their viewport, and the live objects can remain. So this is this is a huge problem. We are we are using static tools, static information tools for analyzing the runtime. Why? Why don't we bring everything to the runtime? So, what's the problem? Why do we do that? What's the, the insight about what's happening? So the problem is that we have an a fixed object model. What do I mean by that? So this is this is a terrible bad thing, it's a good thing. So actually it's not a bad thing. Actually it's a it's most of the time, it's a good thing. The problem is that having a static uh, object model restricts what we can do. Okay? So let me give you an example, a metaphor. So this is, let's talk about time. This is a, uh, an art piece from a Brazilian uh, painter. So basically what you can see here, uh, it's kind of wrist watches which are uh, connected between each other through chains. Right? So it kind of have a negative uh, connotation towards time. <coughs> Then, then the problem is that time is quite useful, right? So time binds us as we are capable of synchronizing ourselves and we are capable of achieving things by, have, by considering time absolute, right? So we all have the same time. But actually we know that time is not absolute when we found out like 100 years ago. So sometimes it's really important to think that the things that we consider absolute are truth just to trick them to see if we do something else behind it. Okay? So, the time is a very easy concept, but in that we, we consider it in uh, it's absolute, right? And we consider our option model absolute too. And I think that that's not a good thing. Good. So what we need is objects and an object model that evolves. That is simple to evolve. We can do that nowadays. The problem is that it's not that simple. We have to have weird ways of doing that an object, when I'm talking about option evolution, I'm talking about changing the object in ways that it doesn't respond to the, uh, the hierarchy of classes and the option model that we have nowadays. That's the key point. So now, I'm going to try to convince you that why is this so important. So I'm going to show you four different tools that we have developed by... Uh, <laughs> Alright, we're, we're going to show four tools, uh, four tools that uh, we built on top of Bifrost, right? So I'm not going to show you Bifrost, because it's, uh, I'm going to show you four tools. And why is that? I'm going to prove you why is that so important that we have this breakage, and we make a small use of it. Okay? <coughs> so, debugging. Let's, let's look at the same problem again, right? So we have this problem that we discussed today. Uh, before, and we need that. So, why do we need that? So, this is one of the questions, right? So, I have I have a, a particular instance variable that changed. I want to know when it's going to change. So, I don't want to look at the stack. I don't want to go to the source. But I want to know. So, look at the instance variable, right? And say, look, next time that you change, please stop. And this is the question that we ask. And actually, the problems that we have, the, our questions are here. And the answers are not in the tools, we have to go to the source gap. So we need to close this gap. We need to bring all these problems back to the runtime. We are taking them away, we are jumping out of the runtime, and that's not good. So, another question would be, I would like to, I'm, I'm looking at a particular object, right? And I would like to say, look, no, stop next time you receive a message. Right? So these are all things that we would like to do, and we do it every day by going to the, to the code and touching and trying to find out where to put it, how, right? So we are messing it up. Uh, so we want to, to close this gap between these questions that we ask and the tools that we, that we provide, and the model that we have for objects. So we have a tool for that, it's called Object Debug. So I'm going to give you a very quick demo. Uh, there is a very long demo afterwards, so after one, no. there is a long demo. If you want to look at it, please come to me. Yeah. Alright. Okay, so I have an image of object debugging with Mondrian. Okay? And uh, in Mondrian, you manage a lot of objects, so it's kind of normal to try to see which are the objects I have from. The problem that we have. We have with the, this display on uh, uh, performance problem was that when we were moving objects, the display on was being sent to all the objects, but we couldn't see that. So we, have, we only saw it when we uh, 
we are moving around stuff and we see to which objects we are receiving the messages. So anyway, so I am executing this and I'm going to... Yeah, sorry, you can see that, right? Yeah. It's big enough. Good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, and I debug it, right? So I get divided, I move over into... And here I am in a MO root, right? So basically there is a root in the, in the graphic and a bunch of nodes which are sub nodes of it. And I would like to analyze this root object. So as you, as you can see, we have improved the debugger to, uh, to provide a bunch of other features. For example, this is proceed until this uh, self receive another new message, and this is proceed until some instance variable is changed. So this is the, the very basic stuff. So I would like to do that, and I can see that the next message was received, right? So what I'm doing is breaking uh, this this uh, this tank that we have to go to the code and put it out. We are basically just seeing the flow of a particular object as it goes. I can move again the message, right? And I can arrive here, and now this is, this is basically I, uh, the inspector. So I can go in, maybe I, I, want, to, I want to look at, do you see here, there are sub nodes, right? So these are sub nodes of the root. I can open it, I grab one of them, and we also modify the inspector so we can, for example, one of the instance variables is nodes, nodes of the node. I can do a right button, how next time this particular state was accessed, right? So I do that, I leave this guy over here, and I proceed. So now we have an MO node, it's a particular node which happens to be the same node. Okay? So what we basically have is a different way, completely different way, so everything is done at one. Okay? Because we have an evolvable mobile of objects, right? So we can break all these dependencies of have to go and touch this class. No, I have to touch this object. Okay? Good. Uh, by the way, these are not the two only things that we can do. The problem is that we do we we can uh, we can adapt also. So we have another feature that for instance I want to stop next time that this object receives a message from an object from another package. I want to stop next time this option receives a message which is overloaded. A, a lot of different, different things that are really useful. The problem is that up to now we are modifying the current debug. Uh, and we have certain limitations for that. The cool idea now would be to think what would look the next future, so the future debugger. Because debuggers have been kind of the same for 30 years. Right? So what would the next debugger look like? And we are, we are working on that with Glam, with two log Okay? Good. So now let's look at profiling. Let's go back to the profiling problem. Uh, we built another tool, which is called Netspy. This tool was presenting uh, tools this year. Uh, it's a work together with Alex Vergel and Oscar Niestra and Lucas Ray. And we are going to look just to one of the profilers of Netspy, which is called the Moment Profiler, which particularly was linked to the, uh, the display of problem that we saw before. So again, we have the system complexity, and the profiler gives us that, right? So it's a runtime representation. This is the system complexity, and you can move, you can move the objects, right? So this basically these are these are the the nodes, these are the edges. Each of the system complexity, each of the nodes represent a class, right? And what we can see here is each of these nodes with the name of the class. It's not that these are classes. These are just the node which represents the class. Okay? And the cool, about, the cool thing about this is that when we moved uh, the objects, one of the nodes, what we could detect is what, it was not only that these particular uh, <coughs> node was being redrawn, so the message display was being sent to it, but we could see that other objects in the graph which were not related to the object were receiving the display of. And we saw that because this bar was grew away. So we, we put a counter, we modify these options and we put a counter every time we receive a display. Okay? So this is a different way of doing profiling. We do it, we have the information is related to the domain. It's not just some class method that was executed this percent of the time. Okay? It's a completely different way of thinking. Right. 
And now I'm going to start listening in a completely different way. So now I'm going to show you how by breaking this of the object model we can think in really crazy ways and useful ways. So what if we do not know what we want without? So the runtime is highly dynamic, highly changeable, and uh, sometimes objects are going to be created. We really don't know what we want to that. So for example, I have is it? Yeah, okay. You have all these objects and then you want to know, okay, I want to put uh, I want to put this registering a loader to the objects that are going to be executed now. How do I do that? Right? So which are the objects? Should I adapt this guy? It's going to be executed or not? We do not know. We do not know which of the options are going to be executed next. Okay? So for that we create a new tool, which is a new concept of doing adaptation or object evolution, which is called Prism. And the idea of Prisma is that it has two modes. One is we, we refine the execution, right? So that, that means that I said, look, I have this execution, uh, sorry, I have, I have this option which is going to receive this message, and while it goes, I want that every single option is going to be uh, executed because of that message sent. I want to kind of have a wormhole, right? I'm going to go through it, and only this adaptation, this option evolution is going to be applied to each and every one of the objects that happen to be executed. Okay? So it will look like that. I have this option, this option called that object, and so on. Okay? This is called, this particular uh, way of doing it is called scarring. So it leaves scar in the code, right? In the objects. It, they, they become adaptive, right? Involved. The other way is a scan, right? So we can, sorry. We start with this object, we execute it, and then the adaptation moves and uninstalls itself. So that's really useful. Right? So boom, 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 right? So it moves around the code, which is really useful. Let's try to see an example. So uh, the button can be better, so that, uh, are the buyers that can look at the history of what we are doing. Right? So if we look at the stack, sometimes we lose, so we have an instant variable that was changed. There's a variable there that we do not know when it was changed. We look at the stack, we not see that, right? Because we will the stack. This is particularly work related to, maybe you are familiar with that, was presented in history in 2007. It's from object flow debugger from underneath that, right? He built something more powerful, which is an object flow debugger, which has button time debugger and button time debugger and uh, flow, flow analysis at the same time, which is really powerful. And basically, button time debugger is we keep the history of the instance variables particular option. Okay? The problem with the button time delay is that Admin had to do it in the VM because adapting the whole image was highly uh, expensive. So this was a terribly expensive thing. So what he had to do is to uh, go and modify the VM to make it feasible. What, he, what we have done is just to concentrate and do this one whole thing which adapts part of it and it moves. So the impact is not that important. It's not that uh, Net. And basically, this is an example. So we have a person and uh, an instance variable name. So the first time we create the person, there is an init. So this is the history, right? So first this one, then we write do. We have field write to do. And then we have uh, another field write to so in, in three different times, right? And then we can go, uh, we can analyze the history of this. Yeah, yeah. thank you. All right. And last but not least, we have also evolution. So far, we have talked about evolution of uh, behavior, right? We, we change the behavior of objects. But we also have structure evolution. And I'm going to go fast here because uh, this is called talents, and it's going to be presented in half an hour in the EWST. So it's going to be nice. So uh, basically, talents are traits for objects. Okay? So it's that simple. And the idea is that we are going to present this, and it's, oops, it's the work of me, uh, Tudor, Oscar, Fabrizio, and Lucas. And they are dynamic and composable views often we use. And let's take an example very simply. We have family classes, and family classes are highly, compo they're highly complex because we want to uh, model different classes of so Java, uh, J Shade 2D, right, in this case. Oh, sorry, in the next example. Change to read classes, we have different implementations for the same methods, like this test class, and so sometimes you're going to have an explosion of that. So what we would like to do is to have just one single class, 
a lot of instances that we use a completely model, a different model with specific manipulation of particular methods. And then we use a model and we don't need any more with the way. That's simple. So we basically have a talent with implement this one, this is only one message. So we have an interaction of this, uh, this class which just delegated to the talent, which is kind of a trade for object. Okay? Uh, if you want to know more, just drop by by uh, the worship. So we have uh, operators, operators like in trades, uh, alias execution and opposition, and we can do flattening and scoping. Alright, so we have an execution friendly object. And this is called Bifrost. So we do all, all these tools were made on top of Bifrost. And Bifrost philosophy is really simple. So we organize the method level, okay? And we have explicit meta objects. So it's just that we have an object, we apply a meta object, and the meta object defines the evolution of it, how this object should evolve. And these meta objects are shareable. So you can use it in other ways. So you have a verification of the adaptation. So we have a meta object, right? And you adapt it, and then you get an evolving meta object. It's that simple. This own meta object can be composed, and you can build really big things. All the tools that we have seen are built on top of this very simple concept. And this is just one example of code. Uh, it's not, so the, the help uh, next message is done just with this kind of code. We, we say a meta object, we say when the message is sent, do something. Okay? We remove the adaptation, and we, uh, we see that help. That's all. So, we built a small toddlers, and particularly by doing that, we were able to quickly implement all these different tools. Some of these you have not seen, and they may have the time, but you can go and access them in our web page. Uh, something that I have to forget is that all these images have been built, you can grab them from the SHG Jenkins server, and they work out of the box on 85. So that two versions are stable and stable, you can wrap them and use them right away. And if you have any questions or you want to see the full demos, uh, just please drop by and I would like to discuss with you and try to find out how I can help people with this tool to think differently and have new and cool tools in the system. Okay? So, thank you very much. So you cannot compose them. 
right? There is how to compose it. You can compose it, but there are no operations to compose it. So that's one of the things that the, the trace in small zone brought in, right? And then the mixings, the problem with mixings is that they apply linearly, right? So you have the hierarchy and you apply the mixings in the hierarchy. That's one thing. And then the mixings have, have to be applied uh, one by one, traditional mixings. That's another thing that the trace in small zone brought in. Okay? Now we have all these new languages that prove it, which have mixes and have a set of mixes that are called modules, which you can apply to objects. But the thing, the difference is that they have a predefined uh, object model, right? So you have the classes, so you have your object, the class with the hierarchy, and then the eigen class hierarchy, right? Alright, so you have a fixed way of applying them. There are some things that you cannot do, for example, of the remotion. Uh, I didn't talk about the operations here, but there is, uh, you cannot remove some method that's not there. You apply a model and you want to remove you have, it. has to be there, a model, right? So there are some features. It's similar, yes, it's, it's kind of similar. Some other things that I discussed here, like flattening and scoping, they, they don't have that, but that's something else, right? So, uh, the balance paper, yeah, you, you can download it from the AWSD uh, proceedings, which is online already. Or from my workbench. No problem.